Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, good afternoon. So, uh, uh, hi, I'm Dr. Jonathan. I'm the consultant emergency physician in Columbia Asia PJ. So, uh, without further ado, I would actually like to share with all of you about life threatening ECG rhythm that you should not miss, especially in GP clinic. So, this is the outline of my presentation introduction. Uh, then we will discuss a, a bit on one of the case, uh, radiarrhythmias, second case, and then uh, the key arrhythmias. So before I start, I would actually like to ask, uh, how common is arrhythmias in general practice? So uh, if you all uh, can help me, uh, you can write, is it common or uncommon in your practice? So uh, in the next 15 seconds, uh, can you just type uh, on your desktop or your laptop, uh, is it common in your uh, general practice. Oh, good. Uh, uh, thank you so much. So, uh, <clears throat> how common is arrhythmias in general practice? Okay. So, according to Scandinavian Journal of Primary Healthcare, in published in 1996, uh, they actually. Uh, uh, this journal is to see that any occurrence of arrhythmias in general practice it was done for three years from 1989 to 1991 in Netherlands. And all the patients that actually presented to the uh, primary care uh, clinic uh, with signs and symptoms of arrhythmias, they actually uh, did an ECG and they actually transmit the ECG to the cardiologist. There is about 868 patients that participate in this study. And out of this 868, they found that there's 32% of them have arrhythmias in ECG, and out of this 32%, 31% of it require urgent medical attention. It's about 2.6 over 1,000 population. So this is the data from uh, Dutch, uh, but this a few years uh, before that, uh, quite some time already this study. So another paper from uh, done by Timoni Joseph uh, recently in 2017, Taki Arimias and Brady Arimias, the differential diagnosis and initial management in primary care clinic. Uh, they actually state that true cardiac emergency are not rare. So that means it's quite common. So how about in Malaysia? So uh, I managed to find this article, it's a one-month review on the type of medical emergency in two public health clinics uh, in Petaling Jaya, which is actually very close to the place that I'm practicing now. Uh, is uh, In this one month, they have 125 medical emergency. So the prevalence of medical emergency is about 0.56%. And ABA is the most common. But if you see here, the cardiac emergency is roughly about 3%. And from this article as well, the predictor of referral to hospital is pain, non-respiratory emergency, and cardiovascular emergency. And you can see that the odd ratio is 63.4, and the 95% confidential interval is 12.9 to 310. That means there are 12.9 times to 310 times more likely that a doctor in the clinic will refer a cardiovascular emergency to hospital. So it's quite common for uh, cardiac emergency and including arrhythmias as well. So let's discuss a case that I saw uh, three years ago. So uh, actually I was working in uh, 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 at that time in red zone. So it was a very busy uh, night in emergency. So one of my uh, medical assistants actually pushed in a relatively young gentleman. So he is a 21 years old gentleman with no previous medical illness. Uh, he's a non-smoker, uh, he's a smoker since 12 years old, about 12 stick per day. So the initial uh, presentation uh, from my medical assistant is actually just near syncopal attack, pre-syncopal. So when I further asked him the history, he has some chest discomfort. Both of the symptoms started two hours ago. Uh, he's alert, oriented to time, place and person, but profuse sweating. So uh, one of the uh, thing about uh, sweating is that I always uh, tell my staff that if you have a patient that is sweating in front of you, you also must be sweating. So this patient should be charged to red zone in, if they are in emergency department. And if you can see here, the blood pressure is actually 70 over 40. It's hypotensive. The heart rate is 42 beats per minute. 
and SpO2 is 97%. So how do we approach this patient? So uh, according to AHA guideline 2015, any patient with a heart rate of less than 50 is bradyarrhythmias. So we will approach according to this algorithm. So uh, this patient, I uh, add every breathing circulation. So I maintain the, make sure that the airway is patent. So started patient on oxygen because patient was a bit uh, deep snake. Uh, inserted two large bore brannula and connected the patient to a cardiac monitor. And this is actually uh, the rhythm that I saw in the cardiac monitor. So uh, can uh, anyone uh, just type in there, uh, what do you think about this rhythm at the cardiac monitor? Uh, anybody want to add in? Yeah, it's okay. Later we'll, uh, okay. So, uh, yeah, okay, thank you. So, this is actually a complete heart block, uh, third degree heart block. So, let's go through a bit on conduction system of the heart for you to understand better on the uh, arrhythmia, especially the Brady arrhythmias that I'm going to show to you. So, uh, as you all know, the pacemaker of our heart is SA node. So, Whoever that is the most, the fastest, uh, with the fastest heart rate will be the dominant pacemaker in our heart. So uh, in a normal person, SA node is our dominant pacemaker. So SA node will, due to the automaticity, it will fire it impulses through the intranodular pathway to the atrioventricular nodes. Uh, besides that, it also has an interatrial pathway to the atrium, uh, to the left atrium as well. So these impulses, once it go through the AV node, it has a slightly longer refractory period. So there will be a, a bit of delay before the action potential, the electrical impulses passes through the bundle of his, the left and right bundle of his and the Purkinje's fiber. So just imagine that uh, you are traveling, let's say your SA node, uh, to easily understand this, uh, let's imagine that you are traveling from your house, your SA node is your house, your AV node is the toe, and this is the highway, the conduction system is your highway, and the Purkinje fibers, your myocardium is the area that you want to reach. Then we can actually understand uh, better on uh, the conduction system and the Brady arrhythmias. Okay, uh, some very fast basic, two slides basic on the ECG. We know that the P wave is due to atrial depolarization, that means atrial contraction, and the QRS complex is due to the ventricular depolarization, and the T wave is due to the ventricular repolarization. So uh, atrial contraction, ventricular contraction, ventricular relaxation. So it's very important for Brady arrhythmias to, uh, to identify the PR interval. Although the name suggests PR interval, we actually measure from the beginning of P up to the beginning of Q wave. So this is your PR interval. Brady arrhythmias uh, is very important that you identify the PR interval. So PI interval signified the delay of the AV nodes to allow the filling of the ventricles. And how about another important one, QT interval, is basically the time taken from the ventricular depolarization to the ventricular repolarization. So the time taken from the ventricle to contract to the time it relaxed, completed relaxation. So some norm, uh, some uh, definition that we know, uh, normal heartbeat is about 60 to 100 beats per minute. We know that bradycardia is less than 60, tachycardia is more than 100 beats per minute. And in ACLS, anything less than 50 is called bradyarrhythmias, and anything more than 150 is, is called tachyarrhythmias. So uh, in this paper, uh, it states that recognition of the initial ECG is the most important a very important role, the most important role in decision making in referring the patient immediately to emergency and cardiology outpatient clinic. So today I would like to share with you how we actually identified this life-threatening rhythm. So bradyarrhythmias, like, uh, like I told you, bradyarrhythmias is due to interruption or delay of the electrical impulses from atrium to the ventricles and usually is due to conduction abnormalities either in the AV node or his Purkinje fibers. 
remember the story just now I told you from the house, this is the toll, and this is the highway and to reach the place. You just need to ask yourself, let's say if you want to travel from a place to, uh, from point A to point B, what is the reason that you delay? So maybe example, if you're, uh, uh, you come out from the home late or there's problem with your toe or there's some block or uh, roadblock or during MCO, so in the conduction pathway. So if you can see here, one of the uh, uh, causes for interruption of delay is reduced automaticity in your SA node on AV node. That means your SA node is not firing the impulses uh, there's delay in firing the impulse from SA node and also there's a delay in the uh, AV node conduction or they can be due to conduction block. So as we all know, our SA node and AV node, we have uh, the sympathetic nerve that sim stimulate both of it and our vagus nerve to inhibit our SA node and AV node. So when there's any increase in vagal tone, it will inhibit the SA node and the AV node, heart, hence reduce the heart rate. And one of the most common uh, cause of this in is in uh, acute coronary syndrome when there's a blockage in your coronary artery. So any conduction problem in the conduction system in your uh, AV node, your his Purkinje fibers as well, can also cause bradyarrhythmias. So uh, AV blocks or heart block, we have three types first degree heart block, second degree heart block, third degree heart block. So first degree heart block is characterized by prolonged PR interval. So uh, if you all like mathematics, so it's more than 0 0.20 second, if you can remember that. If you can't, uh, just remember it's more than five small box. And if you can see that every P is followed by QRS and the QRS usually is a narrow complex. Narrow complex signified that the electrical impulses is travel above the AV node, is supranodular. So let's look at this rhythm strip. So first thing how to identify this is that you must mark, mark down the PR interval. So if you can recall back just now, it's from the beginning of P up to your Q wave. So if you count the number of small boxes here, so one, two, three, four, five, Six, six, seven, about seven boxes. So we know that anything more, this is the PI interval. So anything more than five small box or 0 0.20 second is a prolonged PR interval. So uh, it's a first degree heart block. And first degree heart block generally can be seen even when the patient is having sinus rhythm or sinus tachycardia. And the causes of it, it can be physiological, any condition that can stimulate parasympathetic activity. Uh, aging also is one of the cause as well. Uh, pathological, especially inferior MI that affect the circulation uh, to the AV node, the right coronary artery, if there's any blockage, it can actually reduce the blood supply to your uh, AV node, your SA node and AV node, and this can cause uh, first degree heart block as well and our common uh, drugs. So 3P here, physiological, pathological, pharmacological. Pharmacological like beta blockers, calcium channel blocker, and digoxin. So second degree heart block. So we have two types, type one and type two. Type one also known as mobic type one or Wankerbach phenomenon, and type two, uh, mobic type two. So we go through one by one. In second degree AV block type 1, the characteristic of this ECG is progressive lengthening of your PR interval and followed by a misbeat. And if you can see here, the P, uh, the P wave is always followed by QRS and most of the time it's a narrow QRS complex that I said earlier is supra uh, nodular, so it's above the, uh, the impulses is from above the AV node. So let's go through the rhythm lead again. So mark down the PI interval. So this is the place where you need to concentrate. Beginning of P up to the Q wave. So you can see that, that this is the PI interval and the PI interval is getting longer, longer and longer. And then this will actually follow by a misbeat. So if you can see this rhythm, this is second degree AV block type one. 
So for second degree AV block type one, uh, the causes is actually similar to the first degree heart block. It can be physiological, pathological, pharmacological, and the causes is the same. So for second degree AV block type two, the characteristic is that there's a constant PR interval. There's no progressive prolongation, and then it will follow by a misbeat. The QR, the P will be followed by QRS, uh, but uh, the QRS depend if it's from supranodular, it will be narrow. If it's from inda, infranodular, it might be broad. So uh, let's go through the rhythm strip again. So uh, mark down, so concentrate on this part. Mark down the PR interval. So if you notice here, the PR interval is actually same. And this will be followed by a misbeat. So you have this type of rhythm is second degree type two. How to remember the second degree uh, AB block type one and type two? Usually I'll uh, I'll use this story uh, The first uh, the first one the type uh, the second degree AB block type one, the one with the PI interval pro progressive uh, uh, prolongation of PI interval and followed by miss is something like. Uh, uh, the relationship of husband and wife they always fight 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 then they divorce so uh, you can remember with that method for second degree half block usually you can see that uh, this is the couple that usually they did not argue they look very uh, okay then suddenly there is a uh, misbeat lah. there's a uh, divorce there okay so this is a second degree av block so the commonest cause for this is usually acute coronary syndrome so for third degree heart block, complete heart block, so the main character, no sound, <laughs> is it? Yeah. Uh, the main uh, characteristic is complete AV dissociation. What you mean by uh, complete AV dissociation? That means the atrium and the ventricle, uh, atrium is contra contracting at a regular rate. The ventricle is contracting uh, by itself on a regular rate but there's no relationship between the atrium and ventricle. And if you see complete heart block, usually it's slightly broad most of the time, but it also can be narrow. So uh, like I said earlier, anything narrow means that it's from supranodular and anything broad is from infranodular. So let's concentrate on the rhythm lead again. So what you need to do is try to identify the P wave on the rhythm lead in lead two. So uh, just mark it down. So uh, this look like a P wave, P wave here. If you see that the the T is slightly higher, it might be an embedded uh, P wave here. So this is another P wave, P wave, P wave, and P wave. So you can see that this P wave is actually quite regular. So the next thing to do is actually mark your QRS complex. So you mark it down from this uh, rhythm strip, you notice that the QRS complex is also quite regular. So when you put both together, you can see that there is no relationship between your P and QRS. So sometimes it occur like uh, initially uh, quite prolonged, then the QRS occur. P wave, this one have a uh, misbeat, there's no QRS. This one very close. It doesn't have a uh, pattern like I uh, explained earlier. The, So this is called complete AV dissociation, complete heart block, where the uh, atrium is beating on its own, ventricle is beating on its own, but there's no relationship between the atrium and the ventricle. So let's go back to our first case just now, uh, the 21 years old, the young gentleman with a low blood pressure and also bradycardia. So uh, remember I show you this uh, rhythm uh, on the cardiac monitor. So if you uh, try to map out the uh, QRS complex and the P wave, so this is your QRS complex, okay? See, it's actually quite regular. And then we map out the P wave. So this is another P wave here, another P wave here, another P wave. So you, and then if you can see, then, then the next thing is to do is to check the relationship between your P and your QRS. As you can see that it, the atrium is beating on its own, the ventricle is beating on its own, and there's no uh, relationship between your P and QRS complex. So this is a third degree heart block. So this is actually the ECG of the patient. 
uh, yes, uh, it's quite obvious that this patient is having a inferior ST elevation MI, where you can see that there's a ST elevation in lead two, three ABF, with reciprocal changes in lead one and ABL. But uh, try to concentrate on this rhythm lead here, that lead two. Besides the ST elevation, there is also something else there. So uh, like I told you earlier, try to map out the P wave and your QRS complex. So if you map out all the P wave and all the QRS complex, we know that this is actually a complete heart block. So this patient, uh, after uh, every breathing circulation, I put the cardiac on monitor, able to recognize that this is a complete heart block. So uh, if you if you uh, the next things to do is to look for any sign of instability. So as you all know from the uh, case that I showed just now, I shared just now, this patient have hypotension and this patient have ischemic type of chest pain. So that is a sign of instability. And if you follow the AHA guideline algorithm. The next things to do is to give atropine, try out atropine 0.5 milligram. But we know that this is a complete heart block. It's, most of the time, it's a high degree heart block. Anything second degree, Mobic type 2, and third degree heart block is considered a high degree block. And usually, it's infranodular. And we know that atropine might not work well. So you can actually give uh, IV atropine 0.5 milligram to buy time first while you, you go for the second line. So since 2015, AHA actually recommend uh, transcutaneous pacing, uh, either transcutaneous pacing, dopamine infusion, or adrenaline infusion. And these three actually have the same level of evidence. So uh, in my patient, I actually started transcutaneous pacing for this patient. And uh, because of the ECG and the complete heart block, and uh, he's a very young patient, I actually referred to the cardiologist. And a PCI was done for this patient. The right coronary artery was occluded. Uh, they inserted a stand for him. So let's go to the uh, the second case. So the second case uh, is a 32 years old lady, uh, which I saw I think last year. Uh, 32 years old lady with no known medical illness, presented with palpitation for the past two hours. There's no chest pain. She's alert, pink, but she keep on saying that her heartbeat is very fast. So uh, when we took the uh, vital sign from the heart rate is actually 200 beats per minute. The blood pressure is stable, 112 over 70. SpO2 is 99%. Lungs is clear. So, uh, so when the heart, anything we know that uh, when the heart rate is more than 150, so we actually follow the AHA guideline 2015. So anything more than 150 is tachyarrhythmias. So uh, same thing again. So what we do is uh, every breathing circulation. So uh, start oxygen if patient SpO2 is less than 94%, uh, put in the SpO2 probe, set two large bowl brannula, put patient on cardiac monitor. And when we put the cardiac monitor, it actually show uh, a rhythm. I'll show you the rhythm after this. After I identified the rhythm, we must look for a sign of instability. Any hypotension, altered mental status, acute heart failure, any sign of shock, or ischemic chest pain. So in our patient, there's no sign of instability. So this is actually the 12 lead ECG of the patient. So uh, let's uh, concentrate more on the rhythm lead to help you to identify what rhythm is this. So uh, any taker for this uh, uh, ECG rhythm, anybody can... Anybody can identify this? Yes, uh, very good. Yes, supraventricular tachycardia. Yes, so uh, this is a supraventricular tachycardia. So let's go through the tachyarrhythmias. I will actually share with you how to uh, easily identify the rhythm. So uh, this is the algorithm that I uh, mentioned earlier. Anything more than 150 is considered tachyarrhythmias. So from this paper uh, uh, that I shared earlier from uh, Timoni Joseph, so uh, they actually have a two-step approach in diagnosing tachyarrhythmias in ECG. So this is the algorithm in the paper. So any heart rate more than 100, first thing is look at the QRS complex. Is it a narrow or is it a broad wide QRS complex? The next thing is to see your RR interval. Is it regular or irregular? 
and then uh, there will be a group of differential diagnosis depending on this. Uh, what I usually do is uh, slightly more steps a bit, uh, four steps. You can actually follow the si similar steps, but you add on with this P wave. Is the P wave present or not? Is there any fibrillation wave or flutter wave and the morphology of it? Then you can actually uh, help you to identify what type of rhythm that you are dealing with. So just remember, this is one of the important slides here. So just remember this slide. So heart rate, see the QRS complex. Is it less than 0 0.12 second or is it more than 0 0.12 second? The rhythm and also the P wave. So let's go through the narrow complex, the key arrhythmias first. So if you have a regular narrow complex tachyarrhythmias, if the P wave is present, most likely is sinus tachycardia. If the P wave is absent or retrograde, it can be supraventricular tachycardia. And if you can see any flutter wave there, it can be a atrial flutter with two to one conduction. So let's go through one by one. So uh, this one I'll go through faster because it's sinus tachycardia. Mm -hmm. So, uh, okay, sinus tachycardia is when your heart rate is more than 100. Uh, you can also actually calculate the what is the maximum rate that your patient is having by using this formula. Uh, you use 220 minus the age of the patient. So you can actually roughly uh, know what is the uh, maximum heart rate of your patient. And we know that every P is followed by QRS complex. And your QRS complex, because it's supranodular, is narrow QRS. How to identify narrow QRS is by seeing uh, the width of the QRS. If it's less than three small box, it's less than uh, 0.12 seconds, it's considered narrow. Anything more than that is uh, considered wide. So uh, what are the causes? Uh, physiological, pathological, pharmacological again. Physiological uh, exercise uh, in pregnancy. Okay. Uh, Pathological, like if the person is having shock, if there's bleeding there, patient is having fever, hyperthyroidism, patient in pain. So all the, uh, and pharmacological, like example, uh, beta two agonist like salbutamol that uh, you give to your patient. So some sometimes they might uh, have sinus tachycardia due to the effect of the beta two agonist. So for supraventricular tachycardia, the most important thing that. Uh, the, it must be a narrow QRS, it must be regular, and usually the P wave is hidden, or you there will be absence of P wave, or there's a retrograde P wave. You might not be able to see the P wave. So let's go through the rhythm strip. So we remember the first steps uh, to recognize the rhythm is the rate. So how to calculate the rate? So you can use if the read rhythm is regular, you can use this formula, 300 divided by the number of the big box in the RR interval. So what you need to do, you mark your RR interval, you see how many big box here. So one, more than one and a half a bit. So for simplification of calculation, we just use one and a half. So 300 might, uh, divided by one and a half is about 200 bits per minute. So the rate is about 200 bits per minute for this rhythm rate. But uh, you know that it's actually more than one and a half. La. So most likely it's 220, 240 bits per minute at least. So second step is to identify, is it a narrow or wide QRS complex? So how we actually recognize this is actually drop the width of the QRS complex. So we know that this is about uh, two small box. It's less than three small box. So it's less than 0 0.12 second. So this is a narrow QRS complex. Step number three is to see is the rhythm regular or not. So how to identify this? We draw up all the RR interval. Okay. As you can see from here, it's quite regular. So it's a regular rhythm. The next step is to see any P wave or not. From here, you can see that there's actually absent of P wave. You are unable to see there's any P wave. So for this, this is a supraventricular tachycardia. So narrow complex, regular rhythm, absent of P wave or any retrograde P wave. So it's supraventricular tachycardia. So how about atrial flutter with two to one conduction? How to identify this? So by the name itself, we know that it should have a flutter wave. 
So later I'll show you how 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 does it look like. Uh, so you can see from here. So the usually is uh, the rhythm is regular. QRS complex is narrow. So let's go through the rhythm lead again. So step number one, if you recall, the step is to see the heart rate. So this is a regular rhythm. So you can use the formula 300 divided by the number of uh, RR interval. So, so we mark out our RR interval. If you can see here, it's roughly about one, two box, two big box. Okay. So if we divide 300 divided by two, it's roughly about 150 beats per minute. So the second step is to see your QRS complex. So is it broad or narrow? So you see the width of it is less than three small box, definitely. So this is uh, less than 0 0.12 second. So this is a narrow QRS. So third step is to see is it reg the rhythm is regular or not. So mark the RR interval for this patient. You see that it's quite regular. And the fourth step is to see the P wave. Okay. So is that present or not? Is there any flutter wave, any fibrillation wave or not? So if you just uh, zoom in on uh, here, you can see that there is present of flutter wave. How does flutter wave actually look like? If you can see the image here, it's a sawtooth appearance. Okay. If you can notice that the after the QRS, this P wave is slightly bigger compared to this. This is actually the T and the hidden P wave together. So it make the appearance something like a sawtooth appearance. So there's a present of flutter wave. So how to know that is this two to one conduction, three to one conduction? Basically, you have to see your P wave and the QRS complex. So if you see here, there's two P wave followed by one QRS complex. So this is two to one conduction. That means two to one means there's two P wave and one QRS. Two P wave, one QRS complex. So this is atrial flutter wave, two to one conduction. Let's move on to narrow, complex, irregular tachyarrhythmias. So from this algorithm again, you see that uh, heart rate more than 100, narrow, irregular. You see your P wave. Is there fibrillation wave? Most likely it's atrial fibrillation. If there's a flutter wave, it can be an atrial flutter with variable conduction. And if the, there's presence of three or more different morphology in the pre-wave is actually multifocal atrial tachycardia. So let's go through atrial fibrillation first. So the characteristic of this is irregularly irregular rhythm. Okay. And it's usually narrow complex, QRS complex and present of fibrillation wave. So the ventricular rate usually is about 150 with plus or minus of 20 beats per minute. So how to recognize this again? So uh, step number one, see the rate. So uh, as this is a irregular rhythm, you cannot use the formula that uh, that we used earlier. So uh, during clinical work, it's actually quite difficult for you to do it fast. So one of the way that usually I do is I calculate the number of QRS complex in 30 big box and then I times with 10. Then, because the 30 big box means uh, is, uh, uh, then you times with 10, then you can get the, uh, the, the rate in one minute. So this, so what, how do we do? Okay, so we calculate the 30 box. Okay, one, two, three. So you calculate up to 30 box. So you make a line here. So you calculate the number of QRS complex. So one, two, three, four, five six seven so you calculate all the qrs complex so we notice that there is actually 17 qrs complex so you use 17 times with 10 so you get the rate of 170 bits per minute so for qrs complex uh, uh so second is to look step two is to look for your qrs complex so you see the width is actually about two small box Okay, it's less than three small box. So this is a narrow QRS complex. Step number three is to see is it regular or irregular. So again, you just mark the RR interval. You can see that the RR interval is irregularly irregular. Some are more wider and some are more narrower. Irregular rhythm. Four step 
is to see the P wave. So if you can see here, there's present of actually fibrillation wave. Okay, it's like uh, fibrillating. So fibrillation P wave. So this is actually your atrial fibrillation. So it's a narrow QRS, irregular, and present of fibrillation wave, atrial fibrillation. So uh, second rhythm is atrial flutter with variable conduction. So from the name itself, atrial flutter, it should have a flutter wave variable. So it should be irregular. So irre irregular rhythm, narrow QRS, present of flutter wave. So let's again uh, use this, the four step approach. Number one, see the rate. So as it irregular, you cannot use the formula. So we calculate the, the P boxes. Then how many QRS complex is there? Okay, four, five, so we calculate. You can see that there is actually about 13 QRS complex here. So you times with 10, the rate is about 130 beats per minute in this rhythm stream. Second step is to check your QRS. Is it narrow or broad? So, uh, so I think now it's quite familiar really to you all. It's less than three small box. This is a regular narrow complex. Irregular uh, is a narrow complex. So the third step is to see your rhythm. Is it regular or irregular? So again, mark out the RR interval. So you can see that it's irregular and the fourth step is to look for your P wave and you can see that there's present of flutter wave like I told you earlier soft tooth appearance so present of flutter wave so this is atrial flutter with variable conduction so how about multifocal atrial tachycardia uh, I actually personally haven't seen one yet but uh, in the literature it say that uh, multifocal atrial tachycardia usually uh, occur in chronic lung disease, very elderly patient, and very ill patient. So how to actually identify this? The characteristic is the ECG rhythm have present of three or different morphology. If you see here, the P wave is different size and actually the shape of it. So if you have more than three different P wave, this is considered multifocal atrial tachycardia. So usually seen in elderly patient, chronic lung disease, respiratory failure, and MAT is actually a poor prognosis sign where the inpatient mortality rate is up to 60%. So uh, if you follow is, uh, AHA uh, algorithm, uh, anything unstable, you need to actually, most of it, you need to synchronize uh, cardio word. But MAT is one of the case that even if you synchronize cardio word, you will not help the patient. So what are the treatment if you have a multifocal atrial tachycardia is actually treat the underlying cause. So most of the time, this patient will be in sepsis. It requires uh, vo uh, volume replacement. You need to start uh, some boluses drip for this patient. You need to treat the infection as well, start antibiotic. You need to treat the underlying cause instead of treating the arrhythmias itself. So how about white complex tachyarrhythmias? So uh, follow the algorithm again, heart rate more than 150. If your QRS complex is broad more than 0 0.12 second, the differential diagnosis. So you must remember this uh, for, to simplify, if you are in a primary healthcare clinic, the most important thing is uh, anything broad QRS, just think about VT. Second differential should be VT as well. Third diagnosis should be VT. So just hammer it in your, uh, uh, a brain that uh, anything broad, just uh, assume that it's a ventricular tachycardia. And then, uh, and, okay, so if you follow this algorithm again, anything white QRS complex, you will actually follow the pathway here. So what are the ECG features that increase the likelihood of ventricular tachycardia? So if you have a 12 lead ECG, if you see that Either the V1 to V6 has a positive or negative concordance. What is the meaning of this? That means the V1 to V6 all is positive. You can see here, positive, positive, V1 is positive, V2 is positive, V3 is positive, V4 to V6 also is positive. So everything is positive concordance. So this will increase your likelihood of uh, the ECG most likely is ventricular tachycardia. Or 
V1 to V6, everything is negative. You can see the QRS is negative, 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 negative to V6. So everything is negative. So you also increase your likelihood that this is a ventricular tachycardia. The other features you can see is taller left rabbit ear. You see your this the left side is higher than the right side. So taller left rabbit ear is also one of the ECG features. Present of AV dissociation, that means present of P wave at your rhythm lead also is will increase the likelihood. Present of fusion beat and also captured beat. So fusion beat is the fusion between uh, this normal QRS and your VT. So you see another uh, uh, shape of your beat and uh, your captured beat, your normal QRS complex. So present of this will actually increase the likelihood of a patient having ventricular tachycardia. So uh, there is also a, a, a few very famous uh, algorithm to differentiate VT and SVT in aberrancy. So they have Rugada and Verike algorithm. But what is the problem with this is that it's highly specific but low sensitivity. That means if you have everything of this, most likely is is uh, VT, but uh, absent of this also, you cannot actually diagnose VT or you cannot be 100% uh, diagnose the patient having VT or SVT in aberrancy. So how do you, so that's why I say that uh, most important things when you see any white tachyarrhythmia, just uh, assume uh, in your clinic, just assume that it's a white complex tachyarrhythmia, uh, leave the diagnosis to the cardiologist, the electrophysiologist to help you out with your ventricular tachycardia. So if you, uh, if you uh, identify them as VT and you treat as VT, most likely your patient will be safe. And this is an example of monomorphic uh, VT. You see that it's a monomorphic means that it's a similar uh, uh, shape of it. It's regular and you can see that the QRS complex is white. And what are the causes for VT? The most common cause is actually your acute coronary syndrome, especially when there's an infarct in your vent, uh, or ischemic uh, to your ventricular cell. Uh, I've also seen a patient with low ejection fraction, anything less than uh, 20%, they have very high chance of developing uh, VT suddenly. Uh, the patient can be talking to you at one second, one minute, then suddenly in the next minute, they might develop a pulses VT and collapse. So uh, another cause is R on T phenomenon. Any PVC that occur during the re refractory period, it might induce having ventricular tachycardia. And some of the drugs uh, can prolong QT. So this is very important because I, I think when we see any cold case, uh, uh, green zone patient, sometimes uh, some of us will like to actually give a combo of medication like uh, azithromycin, your uh, Piriton and also your Benadryl. So uh, it actually contains antihistamine. So uh, azithromycin, antihistamine, all this uh, can actually prolong QT. Uh, I think if you check any uh, case report, there, there is a few case report that they uh, documented that some patient that have URTI symptoms went to clinic and was uh, prescribed with azithromycin and uh, cough mixture and uh, antihistamine. Uh, some patients actually pass away in their sleep as well due to most probably uh, there's some prolonged QT occur at that time causing ventricular tachycardia. Polymorphic VT, uh, polymorphic, so different type of uh, shape. Uh, Tosa, deep point, also is one of the uh, examples of this polymorphic VT. Uh, it can be regular or irregular. And we can we know that uh, any uh, VT, your ventricular rate must be at least 120 and above. It can range from 120 to 250. And the QRS usually is white. So the causes is the same, but uh, just uh, the last one, you remember there's actually uh, something called as hereditary long QT syndrome. It's actually an autosomal dominant. In some patients, especially you need to actually get a history that this patient might have a family history of uh, sudden cardiac death. So uh, uh, be highly suspicious of this long Q syndrome, uh, QT syndrome. It can cause ventricular tachycardia. So uh, just go back to our second case again. 
So we know that uh, our 32 years old lady with this ECG that we diagnosed uh, SVT, right? So uh, again, at ABC, good patient on cardiac monitor, we correctly identified uh, it's a supraventricular tachycardia. We look for sign of instability. In this patient, there's no sign of instability. So this is a stable supraventricular tachycardia. We know that from this algorithm, if it's a stable and it's a narrow QRS complex, we'll follow this uh, algorithm, these steps. So we did a traffic ECG just now. So uh, uh, did a carotid massage for this patient, uh, but it failed. So uh, we given IV adenosine 6 milligram rapid bolus in a three way, uh, flush with 20 cc of saline. So this, uh, after uh, giving the IV adenosine, uh, the rhythm actually reverted to this. So uh, this rhythm is actually sinus tachycardia. So if you follow my uh, step four steps also, uh, you can actually identify this rhythm easily. So step number one, you see the rate. So the rate is roughly about 110. So you use is a regular rhythm. So you 300 divided by the number of the big box. So about two and a half. So it's roughly about 110. And then uh, it's a narrow QRS, less than three small box. Then it's a regular rhythm and present of P wave. So this is a sinus tachycardia. So as a summary, uh, to identify bradycardia and AV blocks, you need to actually see the PR interval and the relationship between the P and QRS complex. Uh, we remember that uh, first degree heart block characterized by prolonged PR interval, more than five small box. First degree AV block type one characterized by progressive prolongation of your PR interval followed by misbeat. Second degree heart block Mobic type 2 is characterized by constant PR interval but suddenly followed by misbeat. And the third degree heart block is a complete AV dissociation. For tachycardia, just use the four steps. So uh, the rate, is it a narrow or wide QRS complex, regular or irregular, and your P wave, your atrial activity. With that four steps, most of the time you'll be able to identify your tachyarrhythmias. I hope that uh, this CME uh, will be helpful for you all uh, when you all uh, are identifying uh, any arrhythmias. So do not think that uh, I'm sure that all of you all, if you apply these steps, you'll be able to recognize the, uh, the type of arrhythmias that you are dealing with, and then we can help our patient better. So uh, any question, these are my references. Thank you.